Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Lauren Applebaum, and I'm the Vice President of Communications of Respectability, a nonprofit fighting stigmas and advancing opportunities so people with disabilities can fully participate in all aspects of community. I am a white woman with long brown hair and glasses, wearing a navy blue shirt, standing in front of a black banner with the Respectability logo in white and yellow behind me. My pronouns are she and her. I do want to apologize for starting a few moments late. Uh, we did have some technical issues, but we are so glad to be here with you. Um, I myself am an individual with an acquired non-visible physical disability. Um, and I, I have had the privilege of conducting trainings on the why and how to be more inclusive and accessible. And so I'm really glad that you're able to be here for this discussion. I wanted to note that we have live captioning done by a real life person that is available in this Zoom app by clicking on the CC button at the bottom. How, you also can view everything as a transcript in a web browser. We are posting that link in the chat box for you now. This panel is live, so we will be taking questions from you during the second half of the panel. Please add your questions to the Q&A box to do so. If you are watching us on Facebook during the live airing, we'll be monitoring for questions there too. This panel is being recorded and will be available on Respectability's Facebook page and website after this event concludes. A higher resolution recording with open captions and our ASL interpreters will be posted and sent to everyone who registered next week. If you want to stay connected to respectability, I invite you to sign up to our weekly newsletter on disability inclusion and equity in the entertainment industry. That link is being posted in our chat box now as well. We are really proud to be doing this event in partnership with Film Independent. They're also, no, also a nonprofit and they help filmmakers make their movies, build an audience for their projects and work to diversify the film industry. With more than 250 annual screenings and events, they provide access to a network of like-minded artists who are driving creativity in the film industry. I'd like to turn this panel now over to our moderator, David Radcliffe, who's a member of the Writers with Disabilities Committee of the Writers Guild of America West, while also serving within that guild's inclusion and equity group. He was born with cerebral palsy and has spoken on issues of disability and equity in business and entertainment for audiences at the Kennedy Center, the Annenberg Innovation Lab, HBO, Bank of America, and the Veterans Affairs Office of Los Angeles. His work as a writer has won top honors at the Austin Film Festival and earned him a spot in the Disney ABC writing program. He has written on series including ABC's The Rookie and an upcoming comedic program for Netflix that was co-created by Jeremy Connor of Drunk History and executive produced by President and Mrs. Obama. David also served as a creative consultant on the Sundance award-winning documentary Crip Camp and was thrilled to attend Sundance in person in 2020. I'd like to hand the floor over to David. Hi everybody, uh, I'm David. I'm so excited to be part of this conversation. We have some talent, some really talented artists um, approaching disability from all different kinds of perspectives and, and themes and genres. Um, so I'm gonna let them introduce themselves to you. Uh, and tell us a little bit about their connection to the disability community and the film industry. Um, Alice, would you like to go first? Sure. Uh, my name is Alice Austin. Uh, I am a white and Native American woman in a green coat with a lot of books and a piano in the background. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am a writer, director, producer, and I was the writer producer of the 2019 Sundance um, and Cannes film called Give Me Liberty. And we, um, we had a very long and interesting fight to cast that film authentically. We had a number of individuals with different kinds of disabilities who were in the film. And uh, it was an extraordinary and beautiful experience. And I learned a lot about uh, how challenging this is and doesn't need to be in our industry. So. Thanks, Andrew. Well, hi, I'm Andrew Reed. Um, I am uh, uh, wearing a beige shirt, uh, dark skinned, um, and uh, I am a recent grad from the USC School of Cinematic Arts and uh, just recently finished a short film for Film Independent. So happy to be here. Shana. 
Hey, everybody. Um, I am an Indian woman with mid-length black hair, black rimmed glasses, red lipstick, a black blouse with yellow flowers um, against a bookshelf and a white wall. Um, I like to joke that I'm a triple threat. I'm a wheelchair user, Punjabi, and a woman. Um, I am also a graduate of USC, go Trojans, um, and Academy Gold. And currently, I'm in development on a feature film, which recently won the SF Film Reigning Grant. Congratulations. Hikari? Oh. Hi, sorry, just, just unmuted. Um, hi, everyone. I am Hikari. Nice to meet you guys. Um, I am a Japanese woman. I'm currently in Tokyo, but you see a background is a uh, where I camped this whole summer uh, for six weeks. It's Grant Teton National Park. And I have a little short hair um, and a white shirt. And then I think I'm wearing like a wrapper, uh, little cardigan. Um, I'm a writer, director, producer of film called 37 Seconds. Uh, we, uh, that was my first feature film. Um, I, we premiered in Berlin in 2019. We received the Audience Award and uh, CICA Art Cinema Awards. And it was about a girl who is a comic book artist who's got a cerebral palsy. And we were able to cast or find a fantastic uh, non-actress, but she did a fantastic job, May, who was also a uh, cerebral palsy. Um, I'm also a USC grad, yay, go <laughs> Trojan. <laughs> but uh, uh, yes, that was my first feature. And now I'm in Tokyo uh, prepping to uh, jump on a, a TV show for HBO Max and uh, while I'm prepping for my second feature film. Nice to meet y'all. Awesome. Thank you. Nazreen? Hey, everyone. My name is Nazreen al -Khatib. Um, I'm a DP. I've been making film and television for 10 years. Um, I am a multi-heritage woman, both Black and Iraqi. I have curly brown hair down past my waist. I'm wearing a red Susie and the Banshee shirt, and I am sitting inside a living room in a sunlit uh, Los Angeles this afternoon. I acquired my disability a couple of years ago and I started to get involved with respectability as an organization and started to actually use my storytelling abilities to connect with a new community, um, which I'm really happy to be part of. Thanks, and I realized I forgot to uh describe myself. I'm a, a white man with cerebral palsy. My hair has gotten very long in this pandemic. It's hanging in front of my face. I'm wearing a gray uh, sort of thermal winter uh, long sleeve shirt and um, sitting in front of my apartment wall, which is yellowish. <laughs> um, so Nazreen, I'll start with you. Um, I had read in an article that you had mentioned that um, you know, beyond being uh, part of so many different underrepresented communities yourself, prior to, uh, to gaining a disability, you admitted that you hadn't given too much thought to disability in your day-to-day -day life. And I find that that's true of a lot of folks who don't have disabilities and then later acquire them. So maybe you can start us off by talking about what you thought disability was and what you believe it to be now and how it's sort of informed your work and your perspective. I think my misconceptions were like a lot of people's misconceptions. Um, when I thought about disability, um, I thought it had to be something visible, right? It had to be um, someone who was in a wheelchair um, or someone who needed a mobility device to walk. I didn't think about all of the layers and the spectrum that disability is. Um, and when I thought about diversity, I'll admit I wasn't, I wasn't thinking immediately about disability as part of that group. Um, and I'm sad to say that it took, you know, a car hitting my body and becoming disabled to really expand my perspective on that. Um, but I'm grateful for that now. Um, yeah, I think, I think the way we classify disability in the States, much like other countries, is very narrow. And, um, you know, for persons outside the disability community, um, and I think there's a lot of room for expansion and understanding in terms of what it means to be disabled, how it can be incorporated into everyone's world, everyone's industry, and how it's 
you know, how easy it is to normalize it. Um, that links to something I want to ask you, Hikari. Um, I know that you had, we, there's so many USC people here. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a USC grad as well. Um, and I know that you had worked in, in America and in Japan and chose to make 37 Seconds, which is a beautiful film everybody should watch. It's on Netflix. Um, chose to make it in Japan. And I'm wondering about that, as someone who hasn't been to Japan myself, the sort of atti attitudinal shifts that you may notice between um, Japanese culture uh, towards disability or American um, are there differences? Are there particular reasons why you chose to make this story, you know, in the location that you did? Absolutely. Um, I grew up in Osaka, which is a second capital, and it's a pretty big city. But then um, I moved to America when I was 18. And since then, um, I have a few friends who are uh, uh, with our wheelchair girls, I call them. So my real girls, they, um, if well, let's put it this way. So in Tokyo, if you go in a big city um, or in Osaka, Osaka a little different, but Tokyo, you don't really see very many people in wheelchairs, roaming, uh, you know, going around outside of the city, uh, inside of the city, um, just because it's just, even though it looks very uh, mobile and it's very, um, you know, uh, wheelchair friendly, it actually really isn't. And then I think it comes from the people who are a little bit too busy, caught up on their lifestyle. So a lot of times people don't like to go out. And, but then I knew I have a lot of friends again here that are, you know, with some kind of disability and they just don't like to go out so much. So that was kind of a reason that I wanted to make a movie here. Um, just to show that, that you know, we're all here. And uh, um, I feel uh, people are a little bit more, to me, uh, people are more friendly in the United States, I think it's overall. Uh, here, people are much more shy. And uh, um, so I think that comes from not just kind of supporting each other in the sense that uh, if somebody needs help, they, uh, they don't really, you know, reach their hands and say, do you need help? Um, and uh, yeah, so that was kind of the reason why I wanted to set up um, set a movie here um, in Tokyo, specifically in Tokyo. Yeah. And um, Alice, when we had emailed each other, you had mentioned that there were some interesting challenges trying to get your film made, Give Me Liberty, which is great. Um, everybody should check that out as well. I, I feel so honored to be able to have this conversation about so many great projects. Um, can you, can you speak a little bit about what sort of um, challenges you confronted and, and maybe how, as someone who doesn't have a disability, it opened your eyes to some things you might not have considered about the film industry or about um, production? Sure. Um, it's, it's interesting because I started out as the, one of the two creative people behind the film and um, with my, my partner, Kirill Mikanovsky. And... Um, and I only produced it because we were having such an extraordinarily difficult time getting the film done. And there were a number of reasons, but one of them was financing. And we really, we uh, cast a young woman who's extraordinary named Lola Spencer, who actually has ALS and is a wheelchair user. She was just in, uh, in styles like 50 women, you know, kind of edition this month, which is really cool. And Lola is a force of nature and she's remarkable. And for us, it was absolutely unequivocal. We were going to cast Lolo. And that became really difficult. There was pressure to cast someone who was bankable, mm -hmm. right? And um, we had a number, as I mentioned, of other uh, characters with disabilities. And we were working with a center, a workplace for people with disabilities. And we knew the people we would cast. They were non-actors for the most part. And um, so it seemed to us completely incorrect, inauthentic, disingenuous to then cast the lead woman with an actress pretending to have a disability. So we refused to do that. Consequently, there was a moment where I realized I was looking for like the Mr. Good Bar producer. I'm like, who's the producer? And I thought, oh no, it's me. <laughs> so I, I ended up producing the film. And what I think I'd like to say, the most important thing I learned, um, the people, our cast with disabilities, were rock stars. They were amazing. We never had a continuity issue. We never, I mean, they were unbelievable. They were so fabulous to work with. 
And I think for me, it was really important to, to see that and be able to say it because I think there's fear like, oh, if we have someone who uses a wheelchair or we have someone who has certain cognitive impairment, it's going to make it so impossible and production is hard enough already. And in fact, I mean, our, our uh, cast with disabilities made it better and easier and more extraordinary every step of the way. So, I, th I mean, personally, I think a lot of that quote unquote fear comes from lack of exposure in the first place. So it becomes a, a self-fulfilling yes. concern. So if you don't see it, then you don't think a certain community is hireable. And then sometimes when you do see it, we're misrepresented in such a way that that makes people leery about hiring us potentially, um, but there, as as so many of these particular films show, there's so many uh, extraordinarily talented people um, to put in front of the lens. Some of whom aren't getting the opportunities that they deserve. Um, so we have two recent USC film grads here, Andrew and Shana, and I'm thinking back to when I finished film school, and I reached out to certain diversity programs and asked. Like, who's the person I can chart behind my path behind? Like, where's the where's the Shonda Rhimes of our of our community? Um, and so I'm wondering, as people that just uh, recently finished school, um, whether you've seen the landscape change a little bit, whether you feel hopeful about the future of filmmaking for folks with disabilities, um, and kind of how you see a, a pathway for your own career. Shana, do you want to start with that question? Yeah, so um, I don't know if I'm the best example because I graduated at the height of the pandemic in May <laughs> of last year. So the rule book was out the window, right? Um, but what basically happened was, you know, my friends and I had to move back home. I'm currently in Sacramento, not in LA. Um, and we were like, what are we gonna do? We have a film degree, what now, right? There were no, there were really no jobs out there. So um, luckily we had started a production company in school. And we really just went heavy on post-production. Um, we were blessed that we had networked so much at USC that people were giving us jobs. Um, and at the side, I wrote my feature screenplay that I had developed at USC. Um, and then I ended up finding producers during quarantine. Um, and then we got the SF Film Grant and I'm just really blessed and like I'm knocking on wood right now. Um, but I also think it goes to show how adaptable we are as filmmakers coming out of that program. Um, and just filmmaking in general, like you have to be flexible. And so I do think there are more opportunities for people with disabilities than there were before. It's still not enough, it can always be better. Um, and I'm looking forward to what the future holds. Andrew? Yeah, no, I, I totally echo Oshana's thoughts. You know, I, I, th I do think it's getting better. I think there is more work to be done. I think since graduating, you know, USC has been a huge support for me. I, you know, have participated in programs with Film Independent. I was fortunate also to be in the Respectability Summer Lab program. And these uh, organizations have definitely supported me as an artist. And, you know, also, you know, being a Jamaican immigrant as well and coming over to California and going to USC Film School with no ties to anything um, it could seem kind of overwhelming and arduous. And then on top of that, you have a disability you know I myself was completely paralyzed told I never walk again now I walk with a cane and you know you don't see too many people you know like you for a lack of a better word but um that shouldn't get in the way at all because at the end of the day you're an artist you're creative and that fuels your passion and everyone has their own obstacles and you just have to learn how to navigate yours and you know there are more stories being told about disability by people with disabilities. Um, there's so many untold stories in that world. And I'm just really excited to hear, you know, the other stories being told. I myself have, you know, a story I want to tell within the community and um, I hope we can all bring it to life. I think uh, Shana raises an interesting point that I've definitely found to be true as I meet more and more uh, disabled folks in, in all kinds of in industries is we have built in with, within us um, an adaptability that is just bred out of having to navigate a world that is not designed with us in mind. And that seems to be a, uh, in an equitable world, that would be a very employable skill set, especially on a film set. If you have somebody that is like born to solve problems and put a smile on and, uh, and get the work done. So um, I'm hopeful that that, that those sorts of, um, uh, and that sort of energy carries forward throughout the industry and, and seeing a lot of the projects in this group uh, makes me extra hopeful for that. Um, 
I want to ask each of you who who are who who identify as having a disability, what sort of stories would you like to see more of? Um, and maybe even for the panelists as well who don't have a disability, what sort of questions or or stories would you like to see more of that address the disability community? I think we see a lot of um, when we do see growth in this area, it tends to be on the independent in the independent sphere, not necessarily on the studio side, but um, what's what's missing out there? I think just regular love stories, like stories with disability lead characters, intersectional lead characters, and the story has nothing to do with disability at all. You know, um, yes, that's a that's a part of my life as a as a person walking around as as a person, um, but it's not my entire story. So I think you know we've seen a lot of we've seen a push towards inclusion. But the story still has such a backbone in this person is disabled. Like, yes, that's a section of my life. That's part of my life. It's not everything. Um, and making it everything about the story takes away from the individual story. Um, so I'd love to see just like more love stories. Yeah, I piggyback off of uh, what Nazreen was saying in the sense that just the individuality of the character of people with disabilities, like a run, I think like it had a character with a disability and, you know, showed it in an interesting way that I hadn't really seen before, which I really liked and also had an authentic portrayal of it. And I think like focusing more so on the character, yeah, maybe an element in which they navigate true and, you know, that could also add to the story and teach us something new, but focusing also just more so on the personality and the characters and how it's created you know something special and unique about this individual and more so less so of emphasis on it and the one who navigate so many untold stories within the realm that can emphasize the world and the character i think some of that comes also from the decision to to cast authentically which we we've, we've discussed um, I'm interested, Alice, in what you mentioned before about um, there is sometimes some resistance to that because uh, it, it's not seen often enough. What do you think are the, are the strategies b besides taking on like, well, I'll just go produce it myself then. What are some strat strategies that disabled people might use to, um, to get this message across? I think what happens sometimes is folks will say in television, well, we have someone involved with the project whose brother's disabled, so that counts, right? Or, you know, I had a disabled friend friend once, so that's that's representation, right? Um, but how yeah. do we how do we bridge these gaps so that we can have, um, you know, more disabled people behind the camera and in front of the lens and everywhere else? Well, I think Nazreen and um, Andrew really hit an important component of this, uh, and it's something I've talked to Lolo about a lot. Because, she, so here's, here's a young woman who's a brilliant actress, completely aside from anything else. And she has not, she got so many accolades. She was nominated for Best Actress at the Spirit Awards. Um, and, and yet she has not gotten picked up by like one of the agencies that would go through normally and cherry pick these incredible actors who give great performances and start sending them out on auditions. And I think it's partly because there's this perspective of like, well, I haven't had any calls for someone with a disability. Right. And the mindset just has to shift completely. I mean, you have a role for a woman of, you know, whatever her age is, who's a judge, send her out. If you have a, you know, it, it, I think the part of the mindset is, one, there has to be more authentic casting. And, and if you have a role that calls for someone with a disability, you should make every effort to cast a person authentically. But you also should be casting people in all kinds of roles because our world is diverse. I'm not just sending people to roles, you know, who have a disability to roles that call for someone with a disability. And I think that's the mindset that's just really hard to change. And, um, and I think, you know, we all just have to do it. You know, I think that's part of it. You know, there just has to be this movement 
And I've, I've, you know, pressured agents. I've been contacting people, you know, and I, I'm really honest. And I'll say, you know, you're missing the boat here. You're like, you're behind the curve. This is the next thing and you're not getting it. You're missing something really important. But it's, it's, there's still a lot of, um, I'd say, education, you know. I think um, both 37 seconds and give me liberty, the fact that the that they are built around central performances by for from actresses who are like, quote unquote, untested. And they're both disabled and both performances are so great and so vulnerable and um, and exciting. Um, did that. Is there a part of you that was surprised because you hadn't had experience working with disabled actors before? surprised at how easy, well, I, don't, I shouldn't say easy, uh, how, how fluid that experience can be. Either of you can, answer, can respond to that. I guess I can answer that to that too. Um, sure, I think, you know, as a, uh, as a writer director who, who wrote the story, originally was supposed, you know, um, a girl with, uh, actually she was uh, cere uh, not cerebral palsy, but it was, uh, she was paralyzed. Uh, because I had a very close friend of mine who uh, got in a car accident and I, I was hearing her experience and that was kind of inspiration that I wrote originally story about. Um, and then, um, uh, so just to go back a little bit, but then, um, you know, I think having uh, people in the wheelchair, it, it all depends, right? Like if May, for example, she has an electric wheelchair, which is a little bit more, you know, takes a little longer to move around and what, whatnot, but then it's all about crew. It's all about us kind of being there support and just be there helpful. And if she needs help, or obviously we're around her 24 seven, but then I think everything is, can just, you know, work uh, just perfectly. I think uh, we, be, just because it was my first time making a first feature film to May, acting for the first time we weren't quite sure how her physicality was going to because you know she can't really uh, she's just you know sitting in the chair all the time so we wanted to make sure to give her uh, extra time and not rushing her into something that she, you know she's not ready or whatnot and we shot everything in chronological order uh, things like that, that we tried to be you know care for her um, but and also I, uh, I I think me as a writer the story had to work whether she has a disability or not. I think importance of that was the story. And then I, again, as I, I caught, um, I, uh, what Alice said, like, I didn't want to cast actress who's gonna sit on the wheelchair and pretend like, you know, she, um, she has a disability. It wasn't, my point wasn't that, it was just about a girl who wants to do what she wants to do and, you know, pushing for it. Um, so, um, having, you know, finding May was just such a treasure. We literally researched, reached out to all sorts of different kind of organizations to, you know, um, the, the groups and we reached out probably like about 900 groups and whatnot. But, a, uh, you know, after all that, I think it was just all, it would just came out all wonderfully. And then I think we learned so much more uh, as a crew who never worked with a person with disability. Um, we learned so much, she taught us so much and she was just wonderful to work with. And, you know, I think we learned, um, we, we really, you know, I tell every single friend of mine is like, you have to, like you, you definitely should consider because sometimes, you know, they're one more better than, you know, just much more natural, authentic as far as performings. There's something that, you know, um, that you just don't expect could happen and I uh, uh yeah sorry just not to bumble through it but I, I think it just definitely could work I mean just you know we just have to figure out the schedule and that's it um mm -hmm. so I encourage everybody to work uh together for sure yeah. um we had an, in, in, oh okay ahead. I was just gonna say we had an interesting situation because um we ended up making the film for um a quarter of the proper budget. And we're very grateful to have won the Cassavetes Award at the Film Independent um, Spirit Awards. But uh, that presented certain challenges because we shot in winter. And, you know, we didn't have a lot of leeway. We didn't shoot chronologically, which was a nightmare for the production designer for so many reasons. And um, so we didn't know what to expect either. And we had a crew 
the film, you know, I think we all understand film is, becomes very collaborative and everyone must pull their weight when they do it, this sort of magical energetic thing that happens. And we had a really tremendous crew and everybody helped. And so I think we all, a lot of people were attached to the project for several years. We all had this sense that we, we have to make it and we all work together and so many people helped that the, the whole thing had a quality, it was very hard, but the quality of it was, um, was really positive. And I think that was somehow captured as well. Um, so I don't think it ever, I mean, again, it was just, you know, Lolo and, and, and all of our other cast members only helped our process. So. I think too with, you know, I remember when, when I was on my first show, I mean, this is a crew that solves problems. That's part of the job. Uh, sol solves like daytime versus nighttime challenges or transportation challenges or builds, you know, a, a studio set in, in a few weeks. Um, so the idea of saying, and, and, and yet it's, it's odd to me that anyone would have something in the back of their minds that would make them um, reluctant to bring somebody in that has a different kind of perspective and may also need a ramp. <laughs> Um, Shana, can you speak, or Andrew, um, speak to in the, in your film school experience, I mean, USC has grown significantly since I was there. There's now a, like an Aladdin's palace where the film school that I'm familiar with was, um, what sort of, uh, what sort of experience did you have in that environment working towards, you know, or working on, on your managing your own set and, and running the, running the show as a director? Um, so yeah, I was lucky. I mean, my professors supported me 100% and I was honestly really nervous about that going in. Um, I had gone to undergraduate, um, I had gone to undergrad at Sacramento State University where I made a film basically showing how bad services for students with disabilities were. <laughs> um, so I was a bit of a rebel going into USC and I was fully prepared to do the same thing. Um, if you know, my needs weren't being met, but, um, my professor supported me. The only thing that I felt that I was at a disadvantage um, when I first got there was that everybody was talking about how they wanted to shoot their films on location, right? Mm -hmm. They wanted to like go out and find the perfect place or go to the desert. So many people went to the desert and I didn't have a car, right? I didn't have a wheelchair accessible van there with me for the first year. Um, and I really felt like I was at a huge disadvantage um, in my first semester. And then I was like, you know what, I'm going to just use what I have and use my resources. And I think my stories are stronger because of it. And I think I'm a much more flexible filmmaker um, because I had to do that. I adapted my ideas to what was around me. Mm -hmm. So that was, yeah, that was my experience. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with her, you know, to, to just to piggyback off what she was saying, you know, you are put in situations sometimes where I feel as though, you know, people are not 100%, as with the community, not 100% sure or thinking of the limitations that you may have to encounter. And filming can be extremely physical. Um, but I think, you know, kind of what Shannon was saying, put on a producer hat, hat on in the sense of how can I adapt? Yeah. And ultimately, at the end, I think what drove me whenever I was, you know, reached a wall where I was like, oh, you know, I want to do it this, but can I physically do it? Ultimately, what has always driven me, what keeps me in this industry to this day is the stories. I'm in love with the stories that I'm trying to tell. I'm extremely passionate about them. And even if you're the only person with a disability on set, you will set precedent because people will follow your passion. And passion is just the key to it all and the stories that you're trying to tell. And if people believe in it, regardless of whatever limitations you may have, people will follow you, so. Um, I also just, oh, sorry. Go, go, just go to ahead, like no, add great. To, that, mm -hmm. um, to jump in, I was really upfront with my professors about physically what I could and could not do. And that was really helpful later down the line. And that's just to anybody, you know, going into film school who has a disability being upfront about what your needs are. Like I had to be a cinematographer for one of the requirements in my class. And because I was upfront about them, they had a student help me. And it was a student, right? It wasn't like an, you know, an older person who didn't know the camera. Um, so yeah, it was a peer. That's great. 
Uh, Nazarene, I, I can think of few environments more um, spontaneous and unpredictable than a, a vice presidential campaign um, being lead, lead cinematographer for that. And we've been talking about the adaptability that's built into disabled folks. I'm really interested in hearing about how you felt about being brought onto that, you know, amazing opportunity, and then how you sort of built your day or your schedule, um, you know, to make it work. So, you know, being on a campaign trail is totally, totally different than being part of a set on location or in studio. Um, there's, there's no amount of control that I have over schedule or location. Um, so it's really a matter of keeping up. Um, and, you know, it was definitely a new experience for me. And um, it was one that I'm grateful for. And, and if I had more control over a situation like that, you don't, you never will. But there would be, you know, tools put in place for everyone, not just me as a disabled cinematographer. Um, but I did, I, I, I did the best I could with what I had. There is, a, there is a, yeah, a sort of um, mental preparation, mental and physical preparation that, that when I was starting in TV, uh, I didn't really expect, like, there, it's just, it, it takes over your life. So the idea that any of us would do this work at all is, uh, is amazing. Um, just the, the amount of, the amount of passion and time and, and physical and mental effort we all have to put into these projects is really admirable in and of itself. Um, Shana, I'm really interested in how I think I think of all the folks here and the projects that I saw, you were the only one that like directly addresses disability in a comedic way. And I feel like that's an area that people don't, especially non-disabled people, are terrified to touch. Um, so do you want to give some some pointers to the audience out there about, yes, we need to see more um, uh, the disabled characters and disabled stories, what would your advice be to folks that are, are reluctant to touch uh, those kinds of topics? It's a fine line, I will tell you that. <laughs> um, when I was, because I, I grew up around Sacramento, and I was, I didn't have many friends with disabilities, right? And so when I moved to LA for USC, I was suddenly surrounded by people in the entertainment industry with disabilities, and that was amazing. Um, but I didn't really find that community until my second year in. Mm. So my first year, it was really just me and Nicole Evans, who was a great actress. She was on Superstore. And I would give her my scripts and be like, is this okay? Like, this is my experience and I'm passionate about it, but I, I want to make sure that I'm doing right by the community. And so we would spend hours just going back and forth, making sure we weren't, we were being authentic in what we wanted to say and what we wanted to represent. And I think that's key, right? I had somebody three weeks ago send me a script. They were not disabled. Um, and it was a comedy about a person with a disability um, who was going on a first date. And it was like, it wasn't the greatest. <laughs> and I had to give feedback on it. But that's when I knew like, this is such a fine line. Um, and it's so important that I get it right every time. And so now with this feature film that I'm doing, it's a dark comedy, which is even harder. Um, and we're talking about the intersectionality between being Indian and being in a wheelchair. Um, and it's really just getting a lot of eyes on it from the community of people with disabilities, right? We're all out there. We're all so accessible. Um, KMR casting is a great way to meet actors with disabilities, right? Um, and so that's really what I do now. I just get a lot of eyes on it and a lot of feedback because I'm not the only person with a disability. Mm -hmm. and, and disability in and of itself, uh, as we can see on this panel alone, is, is such a diverse category. Um, you know, I, I was told years ago by an exec I won't name, uh, who, was, who is himself part of many underrepresented groups, but not disabled. He said, um, you can choose to be either an artist or an advocate, you can't be both. And I wanna hear what that engenders in you, all of you as a, as a sort of mandate. Is that true or not? I suspect that this room uh, might feel differently. <laughs> I think that the project that you choose to be a part of is your way of it. 
advocating for others is your way of advocating for yourself and being activist. Um, I think those two things go hand in hand. I mean, that's the, the house I was raised in is, um, is of the mind that whatever gifts you are given are not your own. They don't belong to you. They belong to everyone. So if my gift is cinematography and seeing the world through my lens, through the experiences I've had as a person, I am essentially an activist artist. I don't get to choose that. That's just who I am. Yeah, I would kind of, I would kind of pick piggyback off of Nazarene in the sense that, like, you know, there's a lot of people that just talk the talk. You know, at the end of the day, we're all here because of our passion for film. So, you know, the stories that we're trying to tell, you know, are 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 you know, hopefully progressive. Already, um, or entertain, or you know, drive people. Um, and hopefully in the theater in some or near future <laughs> um but like yeah so and then at the end of the day you know the converse you know we all want to spark conversation so and then and then you can get into it from there so as as far as the onset experience um both for our disabled panelists and for those without disabilities what is it that you wish people and by people i mean uh producers folks working at studios, audiences knew about disability on set. If you could make if you could make a tweak or adjustment right off the top, what would you want people to know? Um, I just have a short story about like the first set that I was on when I was in LA. Um, I was a PA and the lead actress of that production was a wheelchair user. So I was thrilled about the inclusion, right? Um, but the producers were great. Um, but I noticed that they were asking her to do things like, you know, regarding lifting her from her chair and stuff like that. And it was very quick conversations. Like, can we quickly do this? Right. <laughs> and she's agreed, but she seemed awkward about it. And I, I was a PA. So I went up to her when there was a break and I asked her, you know, are you comfortable doing this? And she said, not really, but it's fine because, you know, I'm just lucky to be here. Oh, right. Man. She had been lucky. <laughs> So I was like, no, no. Um, so I went to the producers and I'm lucky that they were so kind and that they listened. Um, and instead of speaking for her, I just told them that like decisions to lift someone can't just be done in like two minutes, right? It needs to be a whole conversation with her and she needs to feel like she has the ability to say no. Um, and that really, I, I think being an ally in that moment helped clarify my mission moving forward. But I wish producers would think about that when they do have actors or crew with disabilities or just people in general, just asking before every set, like what accommodations does anybody need and making a safe environment would be great. Right. Yeah, I don't, I don't imagine that the non-disabled participants in this panel are, are used to being picked up at will on set. Has that, has that happened? <laughs> Um, no, actually, uh, Dima, the guy who played Dima and Give Me Liberty used to, to pick me up and, <laughs> and say I have the <laughs> producer and not put me down. But um, uh, I, I do think that there is this um, conversation that needs to, to be held sort of in advance when you're before you're, you know, so that it's not like kind of in the throes of, oh, my God, we've got to get the shot. We've got to get, you know, we, we only have an hour and then we have, you know, to wrap for the day. And if we don't get it, we're in trouble. So that you understand the demands of the day and what's okay and what isn't okay. And you can accommodate before you encounter that kind of rush moment. Um, but that's, you know, that's true with, it's a question of human respect and, and you know, being a sort of practical producer as well as, you know, to, to think about what people need and what makes sense. So it should it should be again. It's one of those things that should be a no brainer, and isn't. But it's not that hard. Yeah. <laughs> again. And and you know. there's and there's also already a culture of accommodation on set for very often whoever you know whoever's on the poster. So. <laughs> oh. <laughs> if right. That, if that can if that I can know. just be transferred to you know um, other folks, that's you know yeah. seems like an easy 
uh, switch. Um, so what are you excited about? I'm, th this is a strange question coming off of coronavirus, but I feel like this new, this new normal, whatever this new normal is that we're developing, not just in film, but across all industries, has potential to change the way that we think about story, the way that we think about inclusion and accessibility and everything else. Does this spark creative ideas in any of you or excitement for new places that, you're, that your career can go, new voices that you can bring into your, to your projects? Has it changed the way that you work? <laughs> I mean, definitely people are asking questions they've never asked before. Um, this idea that we all have to have, you know, PPE and that there, there are safety protocols. Um, bringing those questions up is like a gateway to universal design, which is awesome because um, universal design doesn't just mean people with disabilities get to be on set but it means everyone on set who needs something, right? Not just people who are disabled, have a chance to name it. Mm -hmm. And if you are asking this at the very beginning of production, while you're in development, you get a very accurate layout of what a schedule could look like, what a set design could look like if it was actually accessible to everyone on set. So I'm excited. I mean, I, I hate to say that considering we're in a pandemic, but yeah, I think it's it's an opportunity that um, the disability filmmakers that I know are taking advantage of. We had a, a number of octogenarians in our cast, <laughs> and um, which would right now be impossible, right? Mm -hmm. Which makes me very sad. And so I do hope this conversation will evolve um and and of course you know vaccines and pp &E so that once again we can give all actors of all ages and you know kind of all all walks um opportunities um because you know i've been told point blank like oh don't 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 do a film with a lot of elderly people right now and i think that's that's really terrible and um so yeah that's another another piece of it but um but I think there's a lot, I think a lot of people are working and we're understanding that there are certain things that really do matter. And a lot of things have fallen away that we sort of thought mattered. And, and it's been a very difficult period for so many people. And it's also a time where you can really sort of recenter and uh, realign priorities. So This might extend also uh, outside of talking about film, but I'm wondering, you know, we have seen with COVID, it, it's, it's hit the disability community particularly hard. And we've also seen now that younger folks with disabilities are not being prioritized on, on lists for vaccination, which reveals a whole lot about our society, I think. Um, so does anyone want to share how they are doing <laughs> right now? I mean, what is, what is this? I have a lot of thoughts about uh, what COVID means for, for me and my family. Um, does anyone want like our audience, our Sundance audience to know something about your COVID experience that they might not? I, I mean, I took it as a, an opportunity to learn new skills, right? I kind of immersed myself in learning color. Um, I've been doing a lot of editing and I think that's helped me again, be a better storyteller and a better filmmaker. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm home with my parents saving money so that when the time is right, I can get back out there. But I'm also really lucky that I have my parents and that I'm able to, you know, be home and safe and quarantine. Mm -hmm. And I know for a lot of people with disabilities, that's just not possible, right? They do have to go out and get groceries and it's dangerous every time you leave the house. Um, and I do wish we were being pri prioritized for the vaccine because um, I would really like to, you know, step outside. But no, I've literally been in the house since July. I haven't even gone to the grocery store, so. Are you baking bread? Everybody I know was Not baking yet. bread for like eight weeks. <laughs> Not yet. I, okay. I'll start that next. I've been making a lot of chai. <laughs> I love chai, so. Anybody else want to share their COVID thoughts? No. 
Okay. I guess, uh, I guess, oh. uh, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, when you are on set and when you're doing, uh, you know, productions, like, I, I definitely find a way to uh, spend time, uh, same as Shana, uh, yeah, I just uh, try to write, try to come up with your ideas and, you know, what, what can you, what can you do more to elevate your stories to, you know, have now more have time to do the research and um, where, you know, if I, I, I had a, a TV show that got canceled and it was on hold for the longest time, but then that time period, I was waiting to get back on set, but then that was the time that I could actually get to work and study and with the characters and whatnot, where if I went and jumped on in production, then I would have never had an opportunity to learn more about you know the characters or story in depth so there's always a way you can um um spend time i guess we are in this you know creative um business so we can spend every moment just to be creative um and we can be creative sitting in the toilet too so we can just, <laughs> <laughs> while you're here let's just you know keep creating um man now i feel like i'm really underperforming <laughs> I, I didn't know i didn't know that was my my peak moment uh, okay. Um, I want to make sure we have some time to uh, open it up for our Q&A, which is virtual, of course, here. Um, let's see. I hope I'm doing this right. Um, hmm. Oh, here we go. Uh, who on set, this, this is a question from Michelle. Who on set should be responsible for being sensitive and accommodating towards those with disabilities? Is it a producer's job or dot, dot, dot? Any thoughts on that? Is, is, should, in other words, let's say, should there be someone designated to make sure that all disability related needs are met? Um, did any of you have that on, on your particular projects? So, um, the one of the last productions I was a part of, um, I actually advocated, this was a character, the whole story was built around um, an LGBTQ and disabled character. Um, and even though I was DP on set, um, not necessarily my hat to wear, but um, I made sure that that um, person and that individual had what they needed. And I made suggestions to the producer and the director that they that they weren't offering off the bat. So in that situation, I wish there had been someone on set that was designated. Um, but what was great was that I was already in the room where these discussions were going down or discussions that needed to go down. And I was able to pipe up and say, hey, have you guys thought about this? Have you thought about this? Um, this is something that could be appreciated or, or could actually make story better, more authentic. I um on um, our set we always had uh, at least one or two caregiver and make sure that you know whatever the uh, needs that may uh, couldn't tell us but then was she was comfortable enough to tell um, caregiver and um, you know and they'll relate it to us uh, because on set we're also crazy um, so I think it's important um, because sometimes you know people have more better understanding than us, obviously. And if the professional comes in, it just makes much more comfortable for actors and actresses or crew members. So that's definitely important. Agree with, with um, we had, uh, Lolo had an assistant who was with her and um, we were really fortunate to have a group support their stay um, in, in, you know, a place that had accommodations and, um, so it, it worked beautifully, but it, I, I felt that was essential to have someone who always was there in the box. Um, so, I mean, it's interesting too, because Hikari, your, your film is so much about autonomy for the character and her, her needs and, and interests and being able to, to vocalize that and the relationship with the mother sort of, sort of right. suffocating that instinct. And so the idea that, you know, I, I think it would be extra important in that case to make sure that the actress was was comfortable and was proactive and you know verbalizing uh, her needs. What did what was her? I mean, you don't have to go into too much detail if you don't want to. I am curious about like her her family's uh, reception of the film, given that family dynamics are so central to that movie. Um, 
their her family was very supportive her mom especially and uh so you know i i've interviewed a lot of people with disability and their parents and how it was because the story had to be very authentic and and uh, the mom character was created by several women who had uh, children with disability. And, and that was the reason why, you know, she became so protective and whatnot. But then uh, in real life, May's mom is very open. She's like, go experience, do whatever. Oh, you know, she's very <laughs> shy. But so it was uh, very interesting to see. And uh, yeah, the, uh, her she has, you know, sisters and whatnot, and they're all just very excited for her to, you know, experience this. And but uh, yeah, yeah, um, I think it's a, it's a, it was a great. Uh, they were very happy, so it makes that's, me that's happy. Great. <laughs> of course, great. I was very nervous. <laughs> <there's a lot laughs> yeah. in that whole movie, but uh, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for the question. Um, open question uh, from our Q&A box. How does or can the industry in general reach out better to people with disabilities who want to work in film who may live in more rural states, i.e. Montana, Wyoming, North or South Dakota? I'm from Nebraska myself. Uh, where film services may not be as prominent, available, or may not, or folks may not realize they could exist. Uh, this person says, I'm visually impaired and I live in one of these more rural states and have found getting opportunities very non-existent. As an aspiring creator who's gone to school to study film and graduated and then gone back to my home state, I found this has been very limiting. Any thoughts on that? Any, anybody here from, from a rural area? I mean, so I'm from Sacramento and when I started off in film, I had the same fear. I was like, how do I get a career off the ground being in Sacramento? And what I did was I just networked with a couple people around me in my city. Um, and we became really close and became like this filmmaking crew. And thankfully filmmaking is more accessible than ever now, especially with phones. You can make like a really good film and good content. Um, but then my friends and I faced the same thing when pandemic happened and a bunch of them moved back to Florida um, in a rural part of Florida. And we have the company now. And so because of that, because we're friends, we already have a crew in place. They're able to keep making content where they are. So that was kind of like my journey, but also I've been doing this at Q and A's. Um, I'm gonna put in the chat, the company website and just send us a contact form because I understand. <laughs> I was in your position like four years ago and I was so scared. I didn't know how this was gonna happen. And um, yeah, send us an email. This is how it happens. This is like Sundance in person. We all just hang out at different events and pass cards around. Uh, that's great. Um, another question from the chat. I am a POC female video editor slash videographer slash motion graphic designer with Asperger's syndrome. I recently finished college and I always expected to get a professional job after college. I had interviews and I get rejected. It's hard to get a dream job nowadays. Gratefully, I work retail to make ends meet. That's not so much a question as a comment. I suppose every, every Q&A has some, but I think it does uh, open up a really interesting area about perseverance, uh, which is another skill set that I think disabled people have in spades just by virtue of living in the world. Um, does anyone want to speak to how they overcome moments of self-doubt or when you hear no again and again, as so many filmmakers do. I, I guess I can talk about that one. <laughs> talk about that. Um, I think, you know, this is, whether you have a disability or not, you know, we, I got shut down, you know, no, yeah, yes, you're interesting, you're great, but then there's always but, right? So I think what we, what I did, I can only speak from my experience was that, whatever I was interested in and whatever I wanted to do, like I just, I just did it. So if I can't get the job as a director, then I'll do editing. Or if I, you know, if somebody's looking for a photographer, I'll just grab my camera and start shooting stills for, you know, film set. Like anything that you can do, um, um, you just kind of have to figure out to do it. Um, and the perseverance is definitely, I think, and then also believing yourself. I, I often talk to uh, high school students and whatnot, but it's, you know, our idea come from our minds, right? Like everything just kind of 
it pops in your head and it's like, oh, that's important. So we have to write it down. So that's how we make everything into the format. So I think our thoughts and the, uh, what we want can work. We just have to keep pushing, even though everybody says, no, 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 you can't do it. You know, it's not going to happen. It's, it's impossible. You know, uh, you know, when you hear that somebody says it's impossible, I get like excited. I was like, all right, well, let's <laughs> make it possible then. Right, <laughs> right. Know? So um, just keep, you know, just keep going and then just, you know, then don't get, don't get, you know, crushed is this, those challenges are always for us to grow. So um, keep going at it. <laughs> when I was in high school, I took a summer class, a, a screenwriting class um, at USC. And it was the, it was that class that impelled me to, um, <clears throat> to move from Nebraska to California and go to undergrad at USC. And while I was taking that class, I was going across campus in one of those like motorized uh, carts, like a, a pride scooter. And this woman, uh, random woman says to me, uh, what are you doing here at USC? And I said, I'm taking a screenwriting class. And she said, you make movies in that? And walked away. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, of course. Like, of, of course I would. I, I mean, this is, this is how I show up. So, you know, I think for a lot of us with any disability, it's just that process of continually overcoming that, even internally within ourselves. Um, and since that comes so second nature, you just kind of roll around saying, of course, yeah, this is, this is how I'm showing up to work and the work will get done and, and uh, you know, wait and see. Um, does anybody else have thoughts on that particular question? I think what Hikari said is absolutely right. You really have to persevere and never, when we had a situation where um, we had the whole budget of our film and a very big company behind us and everything was just fabulous. And we were like the toast of the independent film world and it all fell apart. And no one would pick up their phones. No one would talk. I mean, it was terrible. It was like, we were kind of became pariahs um, which is a scary thing when it happens in this industry. And um, and that was in the fall of 2017. And I had this crazy revelation in January of 2018 that, oh my God, I have to produce this movie. <laughs> and we started shooting in February. Mm. So, you know, it was like, and, and honestly, people said to us, you're done. It's not going to happen. It's impossible. And I think it was exactly that word that made me think, oh, no, it's not. We've got, so it's just like, you know, you have to get up over and over and it's really hard. I'm not, you know, diminishing how difficult it is. And I think it's still hard. I mean, in this time, everything feels a little like the matrix, you know, like we're all in the matrix, like work, work, work. And, you know, <laughs> it's very strange, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, it's perseverance and getting back up and trying. I think you just can't listen to no. Um, and you have to actually celebrate the no's because every time you hear a no, you're closer to the yes. Um, and there's always going to be a yes. So you just have to keep that in mind. There's always going to be a yes at the end of the road. You just have to get there and build your film community. Um, I call it my film gang. Like, you know, if, if you're working retail and you have a film degree, use the retail space as one of the scenes. Like find someone that is always interested in film but never went to film school who will be your sound person, you know? Like build this network, this tiny little gang of yours to create your own content because that content will just keep leading you to the next project. Yeah, totally agree. Um, next question from the chat box. How do you feel about quote unquote invisible illnesses and are there accommodations on set for that too uh disclosure oh boy this is this is a a big this is a good question uh disclosure is sensitive enough should it just be automatically accommodated so i mean there is the legal answer by law things should be ada uh, compliant but i'm interested certainly to hear from from this panel on their thoughts on um disclosing disability uh, if you have the privilege of, of being able to, to choose that, um, and then also um, accommodations once you're on set. I'm also a, I went to law school. <laughs> so, um, 
which turned out to be really handy in terms of production and being sure. a producer. But um, I would think that there is like there is this sort of legal question here as well, you know, and maybe there should be some kind of um, provision made for disclosure where it remains confidential and people's confidential information is well protected so that they're able to get um, the kinds of accommodations they need without risk of um, some kind of exposure that they're uncomfortable with and that's improper. So that's my two cents. You heard it from a law school grad, folks. Um, most of us have MFAs, I imagine, or BFAs in this room. Um, okay, next question. Uh, in the end, did Alice do, did Alice negotiate financing slash distribution so that Give Me Liberty could keep Lolo as a star? Great question. So the, um, so there's a second part of that. My personal struggle is trying to convince producers that authentic casting is worth, is worth the investment. I think we've covered why it absolutely is. Uh, and we're seeing that, you know, there is some, probably not fast enough, but some, some movement in that, uh, towards that objective. Um, but Alice, do you want to speak to that particular question of, did you negotiate sure. financing so that you could make sure to keep Lolo involved? Yes. I mean, so once everything fell apart, it, we were just doing it with Lolo and we actually, and I think this is when people kind of started coming back to us. We were so determined to make the movie. I actually did a, a budget for uh, shooting it in real time, like in 24 hours, which would have been impossibly difficult and nightmarish. <laughs> but but I think word of that got out and they were like, oh my God, these people are crazy. They're really gonna make this movie come hell or high water. Um, and then anyone we brought in to finance the film, and I was actually raising money as we shot, something I would never recommend. Wow. And then had to raise more money for pickups and then had wow. to raise money for post. And um, we were in pickups when uh, we got the call from Sundance. So then our post-production period was just like insane. <laughs> it was insane, but we had to do it so fast. But, um, but so anyone who was investing at that point, we, we had the cast and we did have a couple of sort of well, not quite famous, one quite famous actor we were in discussions with, but I made it really clear, look, you know, he may or may not come in and might or it might not work out. It didn't um, for some really good practical reasons, but um, don't premise your investment on anything but the cast you see in front of you now. Like mm -hmm. this is what it's gonna look like. So, and our, we have wonderful uh, investors, producers who came in and I'm really grateful to them. And they were part of our crazy journey, you know, through film festivals around the world, like, to Russia, France, it was an amazing journey together. And they were, you know, they were brave. And, you know, recouping is another story with distributors, as we all know. <laughs> so, you know, but we had distributors who were brave too. They picked up the film, they fell in love with it, and they took a risk. Um, so, and they were Wild Bunch and Music Box. And I'm really grateful to both of them. So. I mean, again, it's all about finding, keep keeping at it till you find the right community that's gonna support um, your big idea. Um, Hikari, do you want to speak to that also in terms of um, fighting for particular representation for your, I mean, I honestly, I can't imagine your film without her in it. it, it like in my head, there's no like alternate reality where you could have cast someone who was not authentically disabled, but do you want to speak to that particular question? Yeah. Um... Sure, I think uh, it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> back to, I mean, I, I have so many common, like, yeah, experience with Alice. It was just, all right, who's this girl? Oh, Hikari, who is she? <laughs> She's been a first time filmmaker. What have she done? All right, and who wants to cast? Who she wants to cast? So it was uh, all over. And, uh, but I was very adamant about it from the very beginning. And and I said, if I can find that girl, then this is gonna be a girl about a who's very, you know, who has a very, you know, sheltered life and who has a mom who's overprotective. I didn't, again, I didn't want to, you know, cast just just because and just create the story. So that was uh, that was very challenging. But again, you know, you keep pushing forward for it, you know, and it's gonna happen. I think finding um, 
uh, the script actually was originally, like I said, it was about a girl with the, you know, was paralyzed because I was more um, knowledgeable about the experience and, and uh, but then, uh, so the story will be completely different. We had a similar element in the story, but then uh, my girlfriends who are, you know, who is, uh, who can use the regular wheelchair, um, they are much faster, right? Like the way she, like they're faster than me. So <laughs> they always leave me alone. It was like, wait, don't go. <laughs> I'm like always following them. <laughs> but then for May, when I met her, it was completely, you know, it was different and uh, different disability. But then I just really wanted to adapt it. I wanted to, you know, I saw her who she was and she was just wonderful, beautiful human being. And I just wanted to embrace that. So I rewrote the half of the script to get to where it needs to be. And, you know, again, adjusting the story to fit who she was. And I think that kind of made a movie much more original, I guess much more, not original, much more authentic. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's uh, Alice, it's just always, it's tough. But again, you know, you keep believing in it and it's just gonna happen. And, you know, you have to take out some of the moments that you wanted to do, you know, in, uh, uh, for example, like animation and whatnot. I really mm. wanted to do actual animation, but all right, so we don't have money. We need to spend money more on the production. So instead of using animation, let's do uh, just uh, after effects. So all the animation that are in my movie, it's actually uh, done relatively easy, not just, hand, you know, we had a hand drawing um, comic, but then we just kind of layered it and made it look like animated version of it. So you mm -hmm. save money that way and et cetera. So there's always a way, you know, we have to figure out and, you know, um, just, uh, but yeah, but at the, in the end, there's somebody say, hey, <laughs> here's <laughs> that. here, go make your money in a movie. Yeah. And I was like, great, you know, just yeah. so glad that it worked out. But I, There are still folks, I, I hope that this this viewpoint is is dwindling there are still folks that think um, or post online, you know, if that if you cast a disabled person, disabled actor in a disabled role, that's not acting um, as if the disability itself is so totalizing that, um, you know, so that that's why that's why you end up having like Daniel Day Lewis do it instead of finding someone with actual cerebral palsy. Um, but it seems like with all these projects, that authenticity is so key. Uh, to what you know? To what degree did you did you each find yourself sort of shaping towards that sort of reshaping the story towards that decision, if at all? I guess uh, for me, um, me uh, so the lead, so May, who she is, and then the lead actress, the Yuma, is a totally different person. So even though she never acted before, she did did a lot of acting in it. It's just the situation, the physicality is, you know, what we wrote, uh, what I wrote, you know, to fit her physicality. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm sorry, like I totally my brain totally farted um <laughs> so oh, well, you, you, you touched on <laughs> it just just sort of like yeah. sort of tweaking the project to match the choice yeah. of doing an authentic you know ca authentic casting yeah i think that's uh, definitely important that needs absolutely needed but then yeah she was 100 uh, percent acting so i think it was that again is who what what she brought to the project made the movie what it was what it what it mm -hmm. has become yeah again i i completely agree. I mean, I, I think of Lola, we gave a story that was not at all her backstory and her family story. And she grew up in California and she had very, very different life and world. And our character, you know, lives in a big sort of sprawling inner city family in Milwaukee. Um, and is the person who really holds her family together and supports everybody. And, um, and so Lola was acting just as much as any actor, but what you do in casting, and Kirill and I really believe this firmly, you, you, to cast authentically, you cast people always when you're casting who bring something of themselves to a role that makes it more authentic and, 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 and moving and believable. And so, to, to cast someone who hadn't had the weight of that experience and didn't really understand, um, didn't didn't seem right. Um, 
certainly in our case and what mm. with respect to what we were doing so right. that was just not a question um andrew i know that with asia a you you did choose to use an actor who was not disabled but there's a dream sequence in the middle of the film that may have made it challenging to have someone with a disability in the role do you want to speak to that decision yeah no that that you i mean you hit the nail on the hammer with that one i mean i'm you know worked with actors with disabilities on different projects i'm i'm all for advocating but if it's you know you know as i said earlier you know what is the story about and are there essential scenes where maybe you need to be in a situation where you know the actor is not disabled i think that kind of redefines the landscape in which you kind of have to assess and i did think that scene was very important to the story and it was ultimately why at the end i did not go um with a disabled actor for that role because there was elements where you had to be ambulatory and i thought it would be a disservice to try and cheat that in any other in any other way but you just have to uh, me personally i think you have to assess it based um on the story on the situation on the character and uh you know try to be as authentic as possible but also be aware in, of what you're trying to say and tell and how you're trying to tell it um i'm going to jump back to the q a box real quick we've got a couple more uh caitlin yang hi caitlin caitlin <laughs> caitlin runs a post-production company uh here in Los Angeles called Alpha Studios. Um, does some amazing work on a variety of shows and movies. Uh, if you wanna check it out, anybody needs any post work. Um, she says, amazing insights, go Trojans. She's also a USC grad, like so many of us. Um, what is one small action item that any production can implement tomorrow to better include disability and diversity? I think Nazreen mentioned at the top that disability doesn't always get folded into diversity conversations we have a very diverse panel here in so many different ways which is which is wonderful um what can what's a small thing that productions can do to better implement disability in their diversity efforts i'd love to take a shot at that so sure a producer, um can do something really simple at the top of production they can ask everyone involved in the production what they might need and that can be something as simple as an extra chair to making aisles five feet instead of three feet, um, to making sure there's always a ramp on set. Um, and it's not just thinking about disabled community, it's thinking about everyone who's on that set. So before I acquired my, my, mo my mobility disability, I was disabled my whole life and I didn't realize I was disabled. I get migraines, right? Mm. I get migraines once or twice a week and those are debilitating. If I'm on set and I'm getting a migraine, I need a quiet place to go. If I disclose that to the producer early on to say, hey, these are things that might come up. I need a quiet place to go. That quiet place could actually serve other people on set as well. People who, with anxiety, uh, people who are neurodiverse and need a place to recharge without any sound or um, movement or lights. Um, so I think every producer could just make a blanket ask of everyone participating, hey, what do you need on set? That's great. Um, I remember on a particular production I was on, I just sort of jokingly raised a comment about, you know, uh, being on location, uh, there weren't, um, I, I can switch from crutches to wheelchair as as needed, but that's a privilege in and of itself. And and I realized that there wasn't um, accessibility into the restrooms on location. And <laughs> someone said, that's the industry. That was the response. So my hope is that conversations like these can sort of make that response a non-starter in the future. So that the idea of what we see as the industry um, is fluid and can change depending on who's who's there. And, and valued. Um, a couple more questions real quick as we wrap up. Uh, Karen says, uh, thank you for this fantastic conversation. Have any of you worked on projects that were developed from non-traditional formats? For example, structured improv entirely in ASL or from a non-text screenplay? I'm curious as someone for whom language is endlessly unsatisfying to, to write about, 
autistic experiences in. This is this is from a, a filmmaker and actor. So I recently um, edited a dance performance by Alice Shepard, and it was a completely new experience for me. Um, and I was so excited to be on the project because of that, um, because I was editing a dance performance, but also editing it with you know, the fact that audio descriptions were going to go in and that music was going to go in, but we were going to have, I think we had six different cuts at the end of it um, to accommodate everyone and their individual preferences mm. and individual needs. And that was so cool for me moving forward. And I got in contact with everyone from, you know, the person doing the audio descriptions to the person doing the unique sound design. And I'm hoping to work with them on my future film because that's just it was something that I learned moving forward, how to be more accommodating. Anybody else on that one? Uh, another quick question here from Dawn. Is there any data that links having an accessible set to safety? It'd be helpful to have that information to present to investors and producers. Okay, so now we're getting into an interesting area of financing and money and so if people have, you know, uh, embedded biases about, well, is it going to cost more to have disabled people around? Uh, is there a potential liability? I mean, we disabled folks are always shooting down um, those misunderstandings. Um, but does anyone want to want to speak to that particular question? Alice? I'm happy to speak to that because we did win the Cassavetes Award, which is for making a film for under five hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> um, so, and I'd say technically probably gosh i don't two-thirds of our cast had disabilities yeah. um, many of our uh older cast members had walkers and canes and various circumstances that we had to accommodate they were also incredible most of them were former soviets and they had a total soviet mentality they were like <laughs> we start the morning we finish the day we make the movie but um <laughs> But uh, it did. It, it was not more costly. That's ridiculous. Um, I mean, now in a time of COVID, we all know PP&E. There are all kinds of things that are going to add cost to a production budget. That's just a given. Um, you, you know, making sure that there are bathrooms that are accessible. I mean, that just wasn't that big a deal. I'm sorry. And we shot on locations. And we had an insanely difficult shoot and we had many locations and we didn't have any issues. So I, I just think it's getting that, you know, just changing your mindset a little bit and, and not being kind of a, you know, I mean, producers just have to be like, okay, this is part of the landscape, we'll do it, no problem. So it doesn't have to be more difficult. It doesn't have to be more costly. It does have to be considered, but that's okay. <laughs> it's like. I hope someone's tweeting that out because that's a great <laughs> that's a great sound bite there at the end. Um, uh, so terrific. I want to close with a question that's always stuck in my mind because I read this on a message board years ago and I it really rankled me. Um, I was reading something about uh, I think it was hiring managers. This was not film specific, but folks in, folks in hiring. It was some message board somewhere and someone had written um, why would I hire a disabled person when I can hire someone without a disability? Again, treating disability as this totalizing thing. I have several answers to that question, um, but I'd like to hear what yours are. What is something that a disabled person brings that people might not consider, non-disabled people might not consider that we need to be, uh, that we need to start folding into our conversations around inclusion? I mean, an incredible can-do attitude, <laughs> honestly. Like just, you know, this, that I think sometimes in the world of people who don't have disability, there's like a, a something that would be considered just not a big deal to someone who has lived their entire life with a disability. And, and so there was never, I mean, we, you know, I never heard anyone, any member of our group who had a disability say, oh, that's going to be hard. I don't know if we can do it. <laughs> it, was, it was actually, you know, people without disabilities who tended to say that or do that. So. Right. I think Hakari just gave a thumbs up in agreement. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, sometimes people are 
yeah, some actors who don't have this ability demands more than, uh, right? <laughs> and that, you know, going back to the scheduling and as a producer, what you have to be careful on and whatnot. Again, like exactly what Alice said is, you know, we have an AD who can schedule it. We can find the locations. We have a production manager who can just look for a one bathroom, you know, um, uh, yeah, accessible bathroom, just find a location around there. Like we, there's a way that we can create. So, but yeah, it's it's kind of funny to me sometimes, you know, you spend so much time worrying about a person without a disability than the first, you know, people with disability and it's just all people, right? So yeah, yeah. we, uh, I think as, a, as a, with or without, we just have to be there to be willing to help. And even you're an actor, you know, you're just there to, to, you know, create a positive environment rather than, you know, look at me, watch me, well, I need this. Um, mm -hmm. I, I absolutely respect that. But the way you say it, the way you share your, your concerns and whatnot, it's all about, you know, communication. So as long as you are there, be positive minded, this is what we need, but I'll, you know, we're, we, we're here to make something great, then um, we understand that. So we'll, you know, we'll create that energy around it. So um, a positive vibe around it. So yeah, it's always important to be there in the positive yeah, mindset, yeah. <laughs> regardless. <laughs> Anybody else want to speak to that? Two answers. Uh, one, trauma-informed content is always more interesting. And two, the disability market is a trillion dollar market. So you're leaving a trillion dollars on the table. Why wouldn't you tap into that? I would also add that COVID is gonna change a lot of people's lives in ways we might not fully understand today. Um, so the kind of life that you're living right now, uh, you know, I'm saying this to the Sundance audience generally, uh, might not be the life that you're living in a couple months. Um, and so the more, the, the more we do to understand each other and, and, and fold these perspectives in and, and um, employ each other and lift each other's stories is, is to the benefit of everybody. Um, on that note, I'm gonna close here with a question from Corey. Hi, Corey. Uh, he says, how do we get these conversations to the studio and network execs? This is a great question. <laughs> um, financiers, how do we get these conversations to them, the money people? A certain part of me thinks those of us already interested in disability inclusive filmmaking can start creating a bubble of knowledge but we need this conversation to move to the level of people who have the switch to green light. I mean, this is a whole, this could be a whole other panel in itself. Um, does anybody want to speak to that? Getting these stories to put, I mean, beyond doing a Sundance panel that hopefully gazillions of people are watching. Um, does anyone want to speak to getting this message to places where it can really start moving us forward? I mean, this isn't, oh, sorry. Oh. Um, this isn't like an immediate thing, but what helped me was just getting my script out there um, and submitting to competitions. And it's not immediate, but once you start, you know, making it to like the near final round or even winning some of those competitions, people are going to take notice. Um, and so that's what helped me. So what brought me to LA was um, an organization that's actually sponsoring this event called Respectability. And they have a lab each summer that actually puts filmmakers, um, content creators who are um, behind the camera in front of those execs, in front of those gatekeepers to actually share your content um, and make those connections. So if you are disabled, if you are a filmmaker, if you're a writer, if you're a DP, if you're a director, consider Respectability Lab. Um, the application's just open. Um, I want to quickly ask our recent film school graduates, since so many of us out in uh, the staffing world and, and the production world um, get tagged by our specific uh, diversity category and get linked to like disability projects, what are the things that you want to get out there and do so that somebody watching this can say, you know, can, can, think, can think of you for something, um, something else? What are, what are the big stories you'd like to tell? How do you brand yourself? Andrew. <laughs> um, 
I don't let my disability define the stories in which I'm trying to tell. Um, I think it's just like an actor who gets pigeonholed into the same role every single time. You have to make a conscious decision as an artist that you are not going to be put into that, that, that hole. And you have to share and show and prove, uh, just like all individuals, that you have different stories, unique stories, beautiful stories that are worth telling and you have to fight for it and don't let anyone define you by your disability and just continue with that mindset. Uh, Shana, I suspect you're a comedy person. I am. <laughs> I am. Sati um, satire. Satire, yeah. comedy, all of it. Um, and I echo those sentiments um, that Andrew said. Like, I wrote my first script that didn't include disability at all just because I went through this thing where, you know, I was having a lot of family members say like, oh, you can only make content about this. Like, that's what you're good at. And that really, it kind of messed me up for a bit. Um, and it was a good script that I wrote. But at the same time, I was like, I'm in this for representation of the disability community. That's important to me and that's what I'm going to do. Um, yes, I can direct things that don't have people with disabilities or actors with disabilities, but at the same time, I want to because we need representation now. Our people have been oppressed for too long. I think that's a, a strong message to close out on. Um, but I, I wanna thank all of you for this awesome conversation and for the projects that you've put out in the world. I had a really fun time um, getting to know uh, each of these different perspectives on storytelling and disability. And so I hope we all keep in touch. And um, I, you know, obviously a, a, an in-person format would have been awesome as well, but I'm so glad that this virtual format is able to open our conversation up to a lot of folks that might otherwise not have been able to be at Sundance this year. So. Thanks for engaging in this conversation with us today.